Hello, I'm Peter Stefanovic. I'm a journalist at Sky News and the anchor of Sky News Breakfast Program First Edition. And I'm really excited to be joining GQ to host the third of their Big Ideas virtual sessions. So far in the Big Ideas series, we've covered the future of sport and the future of work with discussions on everything from the emergence of AI technology to the ethics of algorithms. Tonight, we're taking a look at a subject that's a big part of our everyday lives, whether you like it or not politics. Needless to say, it has been a tumultuous year in politics, both here and overseas. With the US presidential election now less than two weeks away, would you believe? Tensions rising with China, a global pandemic that has upended the world order, and closer to home, a country that's still grappling with how to protect not just lives, but also livelihoods and recover once we come out the other side. So it's a topic that's been on a lot of our minds lately. But my guests today have examined politics more closely than most, looking not just at where things sit at the local and global level today, but also where we are heading in the future and how to shape that for the better. My first guest is Professor Stan Grant, who is an acclaimed journalist, author and activist, as well as an international affairs analyst for ABC News and the Vice Chancellor's Chair of Australian Indigenous Belonging at Charles Sturt University. With more than 30 years' experience working across TV, radio and current affairs, he is among the country's foremost experts on politics and international affairs, covering everything from the US to the rise of China and the place of Indigenous issues within the wider global system. Last year, he also wrote and appeared in a claimed documentary, The Australian Dream, examining racism in modern Australia with a focus on AFL player Adam Goods. I'm also joined by Ralph Ashton, the Executive Director of the Australian Futures Project, an organisation Ralph founded in 2011 to maximise and share Australia's success across current and future generations. He focuses on conceiving, building and leading non-partisan initiatives to create systems of change while working with governments, the United Nations, the World Bank, business, academia and non-profits. Ralph is also an adjunct senior research fellow at La Trobe Business School and has held visiting positions at Columbia University and the Australian National University. But before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge our partners as GQ's Big Ideas sessions wouldn't be possible without their support. So thank you to our presenting partner, Optus, as well as our supporting partner, Paco Raban, Fragrances. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and emerging and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples of other communities who may be on this platform today. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guests for this evening, Professor Stan Grant and Ralph Ashton. Good morning. Good evening, gentlemen. <laughs> nice to be here. I usually, I'm, I'm used to saying good morning. It's a creature of habit, I suppose. <laughs> All right, Stan, we'll start with you. So you spent a lot of time focusing on politics and global affairs, and Ralph, you have as well. But Stan, are your head spinning like the rest of us at the moment? Um, and, and do you tend to put these things into a broad historical context? Yeah, I think the latter, Peter. I'd like to look at these things and try to see where the dots join up. I think coronavirus has revealed and accelerated a lot of tensions that were already there in our society. I think it's revealed the fragility of our economy, most certainly, um, the interconnectedness of our world and how that is both a strength and also a vulnerability. It's revealed um, the weaknesses, I think, that are inherent in a lot of our democracies, and it's and it's accelerated, I think, what has been an erosion of a lot of the of, of, of our democracies in the world. At the same time, it's set against a rising authoritarianism, most notably with the with with the resurgence of China as a global power um, and, and on track to becoming the biggest economy in the world, but within democracies themselves as well, an authoritarian tendency. Uh, a, a, a government of the strong man that we've seen in everywhere from, from Brazil to the United States. Some would say Boris Johnson in the UK fits that. Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan in Turkey. And in each mm. of these places, we have seen testing the limits and the strength of democracy. So I see this moment as both revealing a lot of tensions that were there and potentially accelerating them and taking them into a place that, 
maybe uncharted waters for all of us. Okay, Ralph, over to you uh, and, and all of what Stan has said is true. It, uh, it stacks us up against other countries in the world. But our government makes the point that, well, we're doing a lot better than a lot of other countries, particularly in the OECD. Do, do you accept that? I think Australia has done remarkably well, uh, and it's down to a number of factors. I think that the the challenges ahead of us, though, are can we, as a country, as a democracy, as Stan's pointed to, solve more than one big thing at once? Mm. So when the bushfires happened, there were a lot of calls for a recognition of the impact of climate change on bushfires, and we were told not today for that discussion but there's not, not enough trust in the system for those who are wanting action on an issue like climate change to wait for tomorrow. And I think you've seen that with Black Lives Matter as well during the coronavirus. So I think a big challenge, even though Australia has done very well um, comparatively during the COVID pandemic is to be able to do two things at once. And also to make sure that as we address one big challenge, coronavirus, we make sure that we're actually creating the future and the country that Australians actually want, not just a utopia for a few. Yeah, and Peter, can I just add something to that too? Um, I, I think what Ralph's saying is, is absolutely spot on, that ability to juggle more than one particular thing. Um, but also we're living in a world where the world that we've known, the world that we've grown up in, is really unravelling. The idea of multilateralism, globalism, we saw... We saw Donald Trump pull out of the Paris Accords to fight climate climate change. Uh, we've seen a push back against things like NATO um, coming from the United States, the, the weakening of the US position in the world vis-a-vis -vis the rise of China. And I think one of the things coronavirus is going to do is it's going to really test us. It's going to say, are our borders our sanctuary? Do we retreat behind our borders? Do we stop travelling? Do we stop trading? Do we turn increasingly inward-looking? Or do we, in fact, make a virtue of, of multilateralism and globalisation as a way of defeating coronavirus? That's really the hinge point, I think, that we're at right now. Well, that's where we are, yeah, because Western Australia is basically its own yeah. country at the moment. Yeah. It, it's, it's sort of cut off from the rest of the place in Queensland uh, as well to an extent. Do you believe uh, one of the points that you were making earlier about how we move forward? How difficult do you think that is, Stan, given the fact that people have become more and more tribal have you noticed that, yeah. particularly along political lines? You're either left or you're right. There's no one, it seems, down the centre anymore. Yeah, I, I think I think that's um, that's true, and I, I think tribalism probably sits at the heart of what we're seeing with this unravelling of the United States. If the US is the great experiment of democracy, if it's you know the US is an idea, it's it's a nation that's formed not around. Uh, language or culture or religion or race, but it's an idea that people can come together and they can form this union, you know, and, and that you leave behind those things that divide you and you come together as Americans. I, I think we're hitting the limits of that. You have a big population. You have a, a huge wealth disparity. Um, people who feel as though they're left behind. You have the legacy of history with the, the, the legacy of slavery and the ongoing still suffering of African-Americans, um, of course, the, the, the genocide of Native Americans. Um, so I think a lot of those, the, the legacy of that history still very much defines America. When you add to it that inequality, you do see this increasing tribalism. And, and that's what's fracturing the United States, Peter. It's, it's almost a country that refuses to be governed. One half will not be governed mm -hmm. By the other. Um, I, I think Australia, we've been fortunate that we've been insulated a bit from that, primarily because we don't share a land border with any other country. Mm. We are a long way from other places. Our population is relatively small. We're relatively homogenous, even though we are multicultural. Um, and, 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 uh, and we have compulsory voting, which tends to mitigate against the extremes of politics. So we're, more, we're in a, a stronger position. But certainly, if you're looking at the United States as a beacon of mm. democracy around the world, that tribalism that you speak of is eroding that 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 citizenship, that shared sense of civic identity that is absolutely essential for a functioning democracy. Ralph, do, do you think, yeah, well, I was going to ask you, do you think that's always been there or do you think that that's something that the current president has just tapped into and is exploiting? 
I, I think there's always an opportunity for it. I think it's become more and more over the last 5, 10, 20 years. I think what coronavirus is showing is it's there, there are two big forces that are colliding. One is how is sustainable development going to work? How are we going to get the balance between the economy, society and the environment? And have we got that right, especially when you think about sharing that globally? And the second is that the the politics of the post-war period have come to an end. The, the political parties around the world, particularly in the democracies, are bankrupt of ideas. We have parties that don't stand for anything. Particularly in Australia, we have a two-party system, which is just entrenching the, the two major parties as vehicles to power, not vehicles to making sense of what's happening in the world, of painting a picture of where we want to go, and then of leading us to that place. So these two big forces, I think, uh, are needing to be resolved and polarisation and tribes is what happens mm. when there aren't people who can navigate that for us. And I fear that that's happening more in the United States and perhaps in Britain and Europe that it, than it is in Australia, but we are not immune from this problem. Do you think globalism works, Stan? Globalism... Um if you look particularly post World War II, uh, it's it's been responsible for um, the longest period of global peace in, in terms of, of big power conflict of global war that the world has ever known. We've seen a rapid increase in wealth. We've seen increases or improvements in in healthcare. We live longer. We're wealthier. Um, we're more secure than any generation that has come before us. I think, though, like anything, you, you start to test the limits of that. And we're seeing that right now, and I think with probably mm. the, the rise of China and this sort of weakening position of America in the world, which is, which is shifting the geopolitical plates of the world. Now, China, um, you know, it, 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 it is a global citizen. It's a member of the UN um, Permanent Five Security Council. It's it's a member of the World Trade Organization. It's hosted events like the Olympics. It contributes to UN peacekeeping operations. Um, it, it is part of a global network. But what it but where it challenges that idea of globalism based on a, on, on a liberal rules based order is that it rejects the fundamentals of liberal democracy. Yes, it engages with the world economically. Yes, it is the biggest engine of economic growth. Yes, it can be incorporated into a global networks, but fundamentally it rejects the ideas of liberal democracy. Mm. There will be no, uh, no, no rule of law. There will be no freedom uh, of speech. We're seeing an increasingly authoritarian turn inside China. The Uyghur, the Uyghur Muslims. The, the, the Uyghur Muslims being locked up, the crackdown mm. on democracy in, in Hong Kong, the pushback now against Taiwan, the ratcheting up of tensions there. And, and, and so I think if in terms of the future of globalism, how do we incorporate further China into a rules-based order that in many ways it rejects? Um, and, if, and if we can't do that, of course, the potential then is, Peter, um, for a catastrophic outcome, the mm. potential for conflict between the mm. major parties. And I think we're really, it, it's going to require some very deft diplomacy, better than what we're seeing at the moment, to be able to navigate this. So mm. globalism Thanks. has worked, but we've hit the limits of it. Mm. Yeah, okay, Ralph, over to you. I mean, that, that was going to be my point, is, is how do you think the Australian government is playing it at the moment? You know, well, does it that, need to, 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 to fight back or does it run the risk of poking the sleeping bear? <laughs> The, the, the two things here. One is that the world is dynamic, the world is changing, and that just points to the need for any system, especially ours, because we're talking about Australia, to respond and to adapt. And we need to keep our political system and the way we, we vote, the way we do government up to date and bring it into the 21st century. We haven't really done that. Part of doing that is being able to engage in a world that has this tension with China, a rising China, and the US. As a middle power, I think the most important thing for Australia to do is have a very clear foreign policy that is completely rooted in Australian values and what yeah. Australians want for the future as a guide rail for where we want to take our foreign policy. And then we need a and, very... And is that what their government's doing? Diplomacy. Do you, do, you think, do you think our government is doing that now? <laughs> 
I think our, I think our government is walking a very fine tightrope between uh, an emerging China and a powerful US in a region where China is closer to us than the US is. I think Stan would have really well, interesting insights on that. Yeah, well, what do you think, Stan? I mean, uh, you've got the threats at the moment with beef, with barley, with wine even. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've got tensions in the South China Sea. It's it, it, Like you said, there is a risk of conflict right on our doorstep. How yeah. do you think our government is playing it? Look, uh, you know, it, it's, I, I, think, I think Tony Abbott once said, we look at China with a mixture of greed and fear. Um, mm. and, and I think it's, it's that balancing act. On the one hand, it's been, it is our biggest, glo- it is our biggest uh, trading partner. It's, it's been the bedrock of 30 years of economic growth in Australia, which is only now just coming to an end with the recession, you know, the COVID-inspired recession that we're in. But at the same time, it, it, it does not share our values. So it requires both a pragmatism in being able to work with China but also um, a, a, a realism about what what is it that, that that we can what is it that we can tolerate, you know? Do do we accept that in dealing with China we are dealing with a country where there will be no rule of law, where a million Uyghurs can be locked up in re-education camps, uh, where they will crack down on dissent in Hong Kong? Can we live with that, and can we still have our trade relationship? These are, the, these are the questions that we're going to have to, 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 to manage. At the moment, um, we know that each time we, we stand up to China, if you like, each time we question China, they will retaliate. We saw when we called for the inquiry into COVID, as you mentioned, there was retaliation around our beef and, and, and barley exports. Um, there will be a price for standing up to China. We have to work out whether we are prepared to pay that price, what fights we are prepared to have with them, but more importantly, can we have a flexible enough diplomatic approach that doesn't have to blow the whole relationship up at the same time? At the moment, Australia is the canary in the coal mine. A lot of countries around the world are watching us. We're at the hinge point of this history between the US and China. What we do, how we respond to this, how we hold on to our integrity, our sovereignty, our values, while at the same time maintaining a strong transactional relationship with it, with China, um, will we'll very much, you know, it'll, it'll very much dictate the way other countries may approach that as well. Huawei is another example. We led the way in blocking Huawei's involvement in our 5G. Other countries have followed. So we we are um, we're we're very much a litmus test of this. There's a few people uh, that I've spoken to lately, uh, uh, particularly from ASPE, who, who who do think conflict is inevitable. Stan, do you think that, that conflict is coming? Look, conflict. Uh, the, the chance of a, of a war with China is still improbable. Um, however, not that long ago, Peter, it was unthinkable. So we've gone from unthinkable to improbable. Mm. Uh, it can go very quickly from there to possible. The po- you know, mm. war, war can start by accident. It can start with miscalculation, uh, by a mm. misunderstanding. What I'm concerned about is that with these increasing tensions, with these flashpoints, um, particularly territorial flashpoints in the South China Sea to the, you know, the East China Sea to the India-China border, um, let's not forget that India and China stared each other down just this year, and there are casualties on both sides. China and India have been to war before over these border disputes. When you have these flashpoints, when you have a more assertive, even aggressive China, when you have a weakening United States, where is the political architecture? Where's the diplomatic framework to be able to, to navigate those things and mitigate the prospect of escalation to conflict? But right now, we have to prepare for the possibility of that conflict. And that's why you've seen a new defence uh, you know, policy, an update from the government, spending more money, investing in more missile technology, precisely for the risk of conflict in the Indo-Pacific. Something that was unthinkable, now is improbable, and we hope does not become possible. Ralph, do you think a Joe Biden presidency changes any of that? I don't think... Whoever's in charge of the US has to grapple with this change in global affairs. There are some of the limits that Stan has referred to and I've referred to around how globalisation works, uh, the the boundaries we're running into in terms of potentially population and environmental limits and what that means for how people can live lives with dignity around the world and have agency in creating the future they actually want. These are all things that 
whether it's Biden or Trump, they're going to have to grapple with. And more than that, and I think that one of the legacies of Trump, whether he goes now or later, is we need to ask the question, not why Trump, but what was Trump the answer to? Trump was the answer to something that the guardians of the American system for the last 20 or 30 or 40 years allowed to happen. And we can't allow that to happen in Australia. The guardians of the Australian system in politics and outside politics, and particularly in the media and politics, need to work very hard to make sure that the answer to the problem in Australia is not the type of politics that Trump has brought. So whether it's Trump or Biden, China is rising. We're moving into... Are you, are you referring to populism there, Ralph? I'm, I'm referring to populism and polarisation and... He's said it himself. He just likes creating chaos. He, do, mm. he doesn't have a guiding ideology apart from chaos. He said that. So I think in Australia, the political parties and academics and media need to really work out what, what are we trying to create here in Australia? Have we listened to the people in all their voices? And do we understand what the people really want for the future? And what are we doing about then arguing about how we get there? Yeah, I think, I think Peter Ralph's right. You know, Trump is a is a symptom. He's a creation of something. He didn't create it, but he's exploited it. He yeah. has tapped into that. It's the rage yeah. of the left behind. It is the people who are not looking for an answer, but they're looking for a slogan. Make America great again. Put America first. There are no, that doesn't, you know, that's not going to solve their problems, but it's going to ensure their voice is heard. Drain the swamp. It's the rejection of the elites. It's the blowback against politics as usual. And Peter, it, it, it comes from somewhere. You know, the United States is a deeply divided society. It is a deeply unequal society. If you look at working class white America, and we talked about globalization before, you know, what's good, globalization weakens one part of the world to strengthen another part of the world. If you look at white working class America who have seen their factories closed down, who have sent their, their children off to fight the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan, who lost their houses and their jobs in the 2007-2008 financial crisis and saw then the Obama administration bail out the bankers of Wall Street. If they look across at China and they think that China is stealing their jobs and someone comes along and he says, you know what, I'm going to make America great again. They're, mm. they're ready for that simple message. It's not an answer, it's a slogan and that's what populism relies upon, but it comes from somewhere. It wasn't help when Hillary Clinton, you know, dismissed them as the deplorables. Mm, it wasn't support. helped when, mm. when, when Barack Obama once referred to these people as clinging to their God and their guns. Mm. It, what are we going to do about this? There is an opioid epidemic in the United States. For three years running, before COVID, for three years running, Life expectancy in the, in the richest country on earth, the richest country humanity has ever known, life expectancy fell. They are dying younger than their parents. They are poor, they are sick, and they're angry. And that's where you get Trump. If we don't address that, as Ralph says, we're going to produce more Trumps, more division, more anger, and, and, and increasingly countries that are undemocratic or impossible to govern. And, and Ralph, do you think that, that division is something that we suffer from here as well? And, and the divide, I suppose, between metropolitan areas and regional areas? Because, you know, by all accounts, Labor should have won the last election, but, but Scott Morrison sort of tapped into his silent majority, as he called it. So uh, uh, do we have parts of that here in Australia as well? I think we have we have regional differences and we have differences across society. We're not one Australia. There are, there are many Australias, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing that we have diversity. I think in Australia we respect difference a lot more than other countries do. We have a very high level of social cohesion, uh, and we have accountability. And more and more in the response to coronavirus, we've we've listened to experts. So I think those four things have stood us in good stead for how we're responding to coronavirus and they stand us in good stead to navigate the next um, two, three, five decades. So I think we're in a better position than in America, but we can't let that be a reason for complacency. We have to guard that jealousy, jealously, sorry, so that so that we, we keep those attributes and that we can keep creating a great country. Why, why do you think 
were, governments around the world struggled so early with the pandemic. I mean, there, there's been pandemics before, granted, not, not one for quite a while. Uh, but but why do you think, uh, I'll start with you, Ralph, um, why do you think leaders at least initially struggled with it? I, I think that leaders around the world have lost touch with what's happening. They've lost touch with expertise. They've lost touch with the vast majority of their public, so they have a narrow base that they appeal to, but they don't necessarily um, tap into the broader um, uh, populace. And they were caught on the hop. I think also there's an, there's an element of we've been very lucky between the Spanish flu and the coronavirus, and we didn't have to deal with very much. And countries that did have SARS or other problems mm. over the last number of decades have dealt with it better than those that haven't. So I think an element's luck, an element is that we haven't paid enough attention to experts, and an element is that our leaders were a little bit divorced from what the public wanted. I think in Australia, we've done very well compared to yeah. other countries around the world. And I think that we should look to our state and territory leaders much more than to our federal leaders in terms of how that's happened. It's just the dint of how federation works. But I Peter, I think it certainly wasn't helped by the fact that you know, China did what authoritarian regimes do in a crisis. First of all, they lie. Um, they, they hid the truth and they locked up the whistleblowers. That didn't help because by the time that we knew the extent of this emergency, of this health crisis, it had already jumped the border. It had already started to infect other parts of the world. We saw it throughout Asia. We saw it in countries like Iran. And then it got to Italy and it exploded across Europe. So we were behind the eight ball because it already got out. And that's why we need this inquiry. We do need mm. an inquiry into tracing where this came from and how it happened and what was the failures that allowed it to get out. But a lot of countries, I think, as Ralph said, a lot of countries dealt with this really effectively. The countries that had had learned from previous um, outbreaks, SARS, H1N1, the swine flu, which, by the way, affected 1.5 billion people in the world um, just 10 or 11 years ago. Why weren't we learning from that lesson? We had a dress rehearsal. It wasn't as lethal as this, but it was far more infectious. Other countries, Taiwan, Singapore, um, uh, South Korea, Japan, they didn't shut their economies. They didn't have to. They had tracing procedures. They had quick testing. They were able to deal with it by targeting where the outbreaks were and shutting those down and allowing the rest of the society to function. So there are examples of where it worked. Now, where it failed utterly spectacularly um, of, was the United States. You know, um, 200 plus thousand people dead, over 7 million people infected. A and a lot of this had to do, I think, with a response that was not scientific, but a response that was political. And the Trump, the Trump political approach to this is we will just, we will, you know, we, we, we will beat this thing. We are bigger than this. It became, and it has become, I think, uh, split along cultural lines. To be patriotic is not to wear a mask. You know, the mask became a symbol of whether you were a proud American or not. When you elevate politics over what is a scientific response, you have catastrophe. That's what we saw in the, in the US. That's what we've seen in Brazil. That's what we've seen in India. And each one of them, Modi, uh, Bolsonaro uh, and Trump, each one of them self-styled, autocratic, populist, strongmen. And Boris you, you, Boris, you can throw into that mix as well. Mm. The other option too is Sweden, uh, Ralph. Uh, that, that was the, the option I suppose the Swedes took was to let it rip, um, to shut down the aged care centres, uh, but then they had the death toll on top of that. Um, was, was that ever, is that ever, you know, an acceptable road to take in your view? I think that what Stan pointed to there was expertise in science and I think that there's a role for science and experts to guide and then there's a role for politicians to make hard decisions on behalf of their people. And in representative democracies, we want our politicians to be making those really difficult choices. And one of those choices is between the economy and saving lives. And I think it's almost too early to tell whether Sweden has been a success case or not. This pandemic has probably got uh, a few months, if not years, to run. And it, at the end of the day, there are value judgments that were being made. 
And I think the more important question to ask is, were those value judgments that were made by politicians, A, grounded in evidence, and B, consistent with what the population wanted? And if that's the case, then the Swedes can do as they did and Australia can do as we did. Um, I think yeah. other countries around the world, maybe their leaders weren't paying attention to what the people wanted. Stan, in the middle of all of this, when the pandemic was 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 breaking free, you had the Black Lives Matter protests. Mm. Uh, now, you did your, your film, The Australian Dream, uh, really well received last year. Uh, do you think on, on that front of racism, we're making any progress here in Australia? Yeah, Peter, I think you can draw parallels between both the response to COVID, the COVID crisis, and issues like Black Lives Matter. One thing is that COVID has hit those people who are most vulnerable, the people who have suffered the most in the United States, as in other parts of the world, are the poor, uh, and the poor overwhelmingly in the United States are, are black. So the black population has really suffered as a result of COVID. And I, I don't think you can separate that from this because I think that was part of, of this, this wellspring of, of anger that we saw. But essentially, these things reveal the same crisis, and that is the, the weakness of democracy. Where democracy fails, you get anger. You get, you get the political tribalism that, that we, we mentioned before. Um, there is, there is a, an ongoing failure to deal with the legacy of history, and I think it's, it's one of the, the weaknesses of liberal democracy. It's built in, this idea that, that we move on from history, that history is something we can sign to the past, that is built on, the, on an idea of endless progress, that things can be measured um, in socioeconomic terms, when we know that history hangs very heavily over our lives. So when someone like George Floyd um, is killed in the way that he was, that to, to, Amer to black Americans, that felt like every one of them. That felt like lynching. That felt like their history. And here in Australia, watching it as an Indigenous person, it felt like our history too. Because, you know, we live in a country where Indigenous people die 10 years younger than the rest of the population. In one of the richest countries on earth, Indigenous people are the most impoverished and the most imprisoned people in the country. In some parts of Australia, the highest rates of youth suicide anywhere in the world and the highest rates of incarceration anywhere in the world. That's a blight on our democracy. This is a test of democracy to deal with the legacy of its history, to deal with, with delivering justice and outcomes to people, to making people feel as if they are heard and recognised and represented. And when you have that failure, you have the anger that we've seen on the streets. And I think COVID intersects with those issues to accelerate them and to heighten them. And uh, just quickly before, before we go to some reader questions, yeah, what, what's your view of that, Ralph? Um, yeah, I wanted to come from a slightly different angle, but really um, build on what Stan was saying there about um, history. And we talk to a lot of leaders, both emerging and established leaders in Australia, about how Australia is making its future. And a very common view, which I personally hold as well, is that Australia is not going to be able to make the future it wants until it reconciles with its past and with its history and, and until it incorporates everything that we can from Indigenous or Aboriginal history as well. So dealing with that history that Stan has referred to is a fundamental building block, in fact, a prerequisite for Australia to become the place that Australians or most Australians want Australia to be. OK. Uh, Ralph, we'll keep it with you. Um, this is some reader questions now. Uh, first of all, how would you rate Scott Morrison's performance in the bushfires and also around COVID? His response to the bushfires were unsatisfactory. It showed an arrogance, a disconnect, a lack of empathy and a lack of responsibility, frankly. Um, I think the, the good thing is that he learned a lesson from that and the response to the coronavirus has been much more expert-driven, consensus-based, even in the context of a democracy needing to be a battle of ideas. I, I think one sort of bad mark against him in the coronavirus is he's still playing politics a little bit too much too often, I would say. But generally speaking, I think done really well in responding to coronavirus, pretty badly in responding to the bushfires. Stan? I'd agree with that. You know, I, I think certainly the bushfires, and that, that was, you know, from the holiday in Hawaii to turning up at, and, and being yelled at by people and the slow response, I think it's clear that there were lessons for him to be learned 
um, out of the bushfire, you know, disaster. And, and I think he has learned from those. And I think Ralph is, is right. And I would give him a tip for his handling of coronavirus. You would hate to be running a country dealing with, uh, with a crisis such as this. There's fast moving. We have so little information about it. We're learning on the run. You have a health crisis and you have an economic crisis. And I think he's handled it well. I think Josh Frydenberg has handled it well. I think their, their economic response was both timely and targeted. Um, job keeper and job seeker were absolutely necessary and have allowed people to stay afloat during this time. The testing period is going to be now. We are in a recession. How do we build our way out of this? When we take job keeper off, what impact is that going to have? Are we going to see the very things that Ralph was talking about before? The, the, the anger that comes from people who feel as though they are neglected, that they have been abandoned, that they have been left behind. And poor people are angry people. And I think that test is still to come. But immediately for this crisis, yeah, I'd, I'd give them a tick. Okay. Uh, Stan, do you think we are likely to have a female PM again anytime soon? I can't see one on the horizon, and that's just looking at the people who are in our parliament right now. No one jumps out at me as a potential prime minister. I mean, if you're looking at the liberal side, you've got Scott Morrison there. More than likely, given the, the, the strength of his victory before, um, he will win at the next election. And if he goes beyond that, Josh Frydenberg's yeah. no doubt got a leadership baton in his backpack <laughs> that he'd like to pull out as well. On the other side, you have Anthony Albanese there now. Now, if they lose the next election, you know, with more than likely there'll be a challenge to his leadership, but you have other people lining up uh, in the party there, probably mostly male. Tanya Plibersek is there, but she hasn't given any indication that that's something that she necessarily aspires to, yeah. that level of leadership. So I can't see that in the short term uh, or the medium term, but of course it's something. And I think after Julia Gillard has sort of broken through that ceiling, it of course it is something that, that we will see again. Mm. Hard to disagree with any of that, Ralph. No, I, I totally agree. There's, there's, you just have to look at the leaders and deputy leaders of the parties. Yeah. All male. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Ralph, a question for you. What kind of work do you do with the Australian Futures Project? So we're a nonpartisan organisation. We do research to understand how Australia makes its future and we implement projects to improve how the country makes its future. So one example of that is we have a professional development program for politicians based on engaging with politicians and them telling us that they have a really hard job, but unlike plumbers or doctors, they get no training. So we created a very practical values-based leadership program for politicians. So we research and we implement change to make things better. Okay. Uh, Stan, back to you. Uh, a, a, a double banger question here. Do you plan to make any more films and would you enter politics yourself? Uh, not likely to go into politics. In fact, he could rule that one, that one out. It, it, it's something that I've considered in the past, and you know, and I've, and, you know, I've been honoured to be asked by, by all sides. And I, I, you know, and I'm, I'm really pleased about that because I, I, you know, genuinely, I'm not partisan. I'm not someone who's ideological. And um, you know, uh, to be to have been asked by both sides, I think recognises the fact that I don't think that I'm particularly partisan. Um, but no, look, not likely. But a, a, another film, yeah, I'm, I'm actually working on a. A script at the moment uh, with Philip Noyce, the director, um, mm -hmm. for a feature film, not a documentary. He worked on the documentary before with The Australian Dream, but this one will be a feature film, which we're fairly well advanced on, um, on uh, Pemaway, uh, the Indigenous warrior who led the resistance to the arrival of the First Fleet, fought a, a war mm -hmm. in Sydney for 12 years through three different governors um, before he was finally captured. He was beheaded and his head still sits in a museum in Britain today. So we're looking at telling the story of Pemaway, which, which really will be Australia's brave heart. You know, it's, it's a story that should speak to all of us, a story that we could all come together around. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 uh, hopefully we should be able to see some progress on that in the next, next year or so. Wow. Well, good luck with that. Uh, Ralph, yeah, thanks. Uh, is there a current political figure that you admire most around the world at the moment? Yeah, I want to bring it a bit closer to home. I admire all the politicians who take part in our parliamentary mm -hmm. leaders program and who put up their hand and say, hey, I've got a really tough gig and I'm going to actually go and invest in getting better at that job myself. So 
I admire them from all sides, all parties, state, federal. What about a country whose system is an example of model governance, in your view? Yeah, a bit to my point earlier, I think that any keep reinventing itself. I think we can learn from a lot of countries around the world, from New Zealand in some ways, from South Korea in other ways, from Taiwan, even from the United States. Um, so I don't think any country has nailed it. And every country needs to keep working on the things that Stan and I have brought up about the weakness of democracy in the 21st century. Okay. Uh, a quick one to close. Uh, I'll start with you, Ralph, um, while you're there. Uh, would you hazard a guess who you believe is going to win the US election? Well, I have a terrible record on predicting election <laughs> results, and I think Biden will win. Okay. Stan? Well, the numbers would say Biden would win, but the numbers said Hillary Clinton would win in 2016. <laughs> but but uh, consistently, Biden leads uh, and leads more strongly in areas where Hillary Clinton wasn't in 2016. The swing states are leaning towards Biden. And as we know, it's the swing states that, that decide this. I mean, history is our guide. We have to go back to 1948 when Truman beat Dewey and Truman was as far behind then as Trump is now. So Trump would have to pull something off that hasn't been done in, what, over 70 years. It would appear to be unlikely, but here's the caveat. The caveat is the people who, who will turn out, Peter, because as we know, only about 60% of eligible voters actually vote in US elections. Who will get out the vote? The polls aren't telling us that. They're telling us what we know. They're not telling us what we don't know. The numbers would say Biden, there's always, there's always that possibility of a rogue event. But it is Donald Trump and you don't Donald write Trump. him off. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, that is all the time we've got this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who watched and who asked questions. And, of course, a huge thanks to Professor Stan Grant and Ralph Ashton for their time. Brilliant chat, guys. I really enjoyed it. And thanks again, everyone, for taking part in this GQ Big Ideas session. GQ will be back in two weeks with one final instalment of the series, the GQ Big Ideas Summit. So head to gq.com.au to register your, register your interest now. Thanks again and good night. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Ralph. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, guys.